mind, and we never want to take it for granted that he has spared us to see another day. And so let me honor the presence of the Lord to Associate Pastor Oliphant and Associate Pastor Brown, their respective families, including my own family, our officers, Missionary Palmer here tonight, brothers and sisters, visiting ones that are online and in the house. Children, good to see you tonight in the name of the Lord. Our theme for the week focuses on us making ourselves available to the Lord to be used by Him. And for us to be used, we need to be consecrated. Somebody say consecrated. Right, consecrated for service. And so we're going to be exploring that topic tonight, consecrated for service. Lord, I'm available. I'm available. And just that phrase alone speaks volume to our hearts because it means that we're going to make sure that he has our attention. And when the Lord instructs us, we will give him the time that is so needed. Because many a times we struggle with even just being available in prayer for the Lord. Struggle with just living a devotional life. You know, just spending time to read God's word, spending time to pray. And then added to that, we're now going to make ourselves available so he can use us at his will. And so there's a whole paradigm shift the whole mindset that has to be changed so that the things I do, they are governed by the motive that the Lord has placed within my heart because I need to honor him in everything that I do. All right? Praise the name of the Lord. Consecrated for service. Our objectives is to explore the preparation, pro preparation necessary for service before God, which includes the following, Clo cleansed for service. So this is what the, and we're going from an Old Testament perspective to relate, to relate that, that to, to get a better understanding of what it really means to be consecrated in this day and age in which we live. If we have an appreciation for what the priests went through, in the process of being consecrated for service, then we should have a greater understanding of what is required of us today in consecrating ourselves. All right, so it's a pattern, because that which was given before, the things that were written before are written for our learning. All right, so we're going to learn from the Old Testament. And if you ask why, even though we're using the priest, remember now that we are the royal, priesthood. So there is still a priesthood that exists today. So the priesthood, even though the priesthood was a different type of priesthood then, a priesthood actually exists. All right. So today we are priests. Before we are anything else, once we have been baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost, we become a part of the royal priesthood of Almighty God. Amen, somebody? And so if we have an understanding of how the Old Testament priest process of preparation went. We can now apply our own lives today. They had to be cleansed, clothed, consecrated for service, and consecrated by sacrifice. You're seeing that? Number one, somebody say cleansed for service. Number two, clothed for service. Number three, consecrated for service. And number four, consecrated by sacrifice. And the same holds true today. All right, so we're going to look at the Old Testament principle. Then we're going to take it to the New Testament and apply it to our own lives so that we can actually be consecrated to the Lord for use. All right, so cleanse for service. So consecration began with Moses thoroughly washing Aaron and his sons, right? So Moses, Aaron, and his sons had to 
get a bath. They had to be bathed. They had to be cleansed before they actually start serving. Remember now, they have a physical tabernacle, a physical structure that they are operating around. And this structure is where God is inhabiting. God is tabernacling with his people in the wilderness. And they have the responsibility to entertain and to maintain the presence of God with them. Follow me closely. So the priest is the one, are the ones that has the responsibility to make sure that God is in the nation. All right? But they have to go through a process and, a, and apply the principles that he outlined for them so that he stays with them. And this is important because God does not tolerate sin. So there has to be a set of people who is going to be there to stand as mediators between God, a holy God, and a sinful set of people. And that's where the Levites comes in. So Moses physically, literally bathed these men. All right, so the Bible says in Exodus 29, 4, And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall wash them with water. Leviticus 8 and verse 6 says, And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. All right, so they were bathed. And this is a, they're being cleansed for service. So if ever I'm going to actually serve the Lord, I need to be cleansed. All right? But we're not going to anybody to bathe us and then you begin to understand why some people go to bomb yard and get somebody beat them off because they're trying to beat off a curse of them but that's not what this is this is persons being consecrated for service to almighty god all right so after which the priests had the responsibility to cleanse themselves so after that initial bath they now have the responsibility to make sure that they remain clean by continuously cleansing themselves. And so Exodus 30, 19 through 20 says, For Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle, of the congregation they shall wash with water that they die not or when they come near to the altar to minister to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord so Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands wash their feet so they do not die so they can effectively minister before Almighty God all right so that's cleansed for service so the washing has a twofold meaning all right the washing has a twofold meaning and so the priest comes to the brazen laver and they wash their hands and they wash their feet so they can go into the tabernacle to minister before almighty god now it typifies number one it typifies the priest regeneration so as a believer, we are saved by, the Bible says, the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So what are we saying? When we came to the Lord, repented of our sins, and got baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's our initial washing. That's what Moses did to the priest, and that's what Jesus now does to us. That Holy Ghost infilling, a washing actually took place. So that's the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So the Lord is our Moses today who washes us by the regenerating. So there's a renewal of my spirit that takes place. The cleansing of, my, of the filthiness of the spirit. And a regeneration takes place. And I'm, and I'm now a partaker of the divine nature of jesus christ he cleansed me 
Have you ever heard, and probably you've had your own experience, I've heard one young lady when she got the Holy Ghost says, I feel so clean. I feel so clean. That cleanliness that she's speaking about is not a shower. It's a cleanliness inside of her soul. And I remember asking the young lady, I said, um, yes, that's wonderful and nice. Um, tell me more about it. She said, I feel so clean. I just feel clean. That's all she could say. She just said, spoke about how clean she felt because the Lord had cleansed her spirit. When, when somebody has been corrupted in their minds and defiled by all type of immorality and all kind of um, sins of the spirit and of the flesh, and they come into a relationship or come into contact with Jesus Christ, God cleanses that person's spirit. So that's the initial washing. We talk about a twofold meaning of the cleansing process. And number one, it typifies the priest regeneration. And then number two, like the high priest believers must be cleansed from daily sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So after our initial cleansing, we repented of our sins, got baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. As we live for the Lord each day, we don't need to go back and get baptized again. You know? What we need to know, do is as we live, if we falter, if we fail, we repent of our sins. And that's the daily cleansing that takes place. So similarly to how we go to the bathroom on a daily basis and we have a bath, we need to bathe spiritually as well. Because if I don't, if I don't bathe naturally, I become, yes, you know it. Well, similarly, if I don't bathe myself spiritually, I am spiritually, all right. And not that human beings is going to smell that stinkiness, but God himself. Because the Bible says our lives become a sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of God. So when God goes on, he needs to say, wow. When, when, when the Bible says, Noah found grace in the eyes of God, God looked down and, yes. And he offered a sacrifice after the, um, after the period of destruction of the earth by water. And he offered, it became a sweet-smelling savor in the nostril of God. And so we, on a daily basis, as we live before Almighty God, we ensure that we give ourselves to the reading of God's word. Whereby shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed to the word of God. Whereby shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed? So that's why we spend time in the word and in prayer and keep my spirit clean. So just like the Old Testament priests had to be cleansed for service, today we also need to be cleansed for service. Moses bathed them and then they had the physical responsibility to go to the brazen laver, wash their hands, wash their feet. Now, hands and feet, notice, it's not the whole body they bathe. They bathe, the, they wash their hands, and they wash their feet. The washing of the hands is, sim is symbolic of the conduct of the individual. So, how do I conduct my life? Am I Christ-like? My words, my speech, my actions, are they demonstrating Jesus Christ? That speaks to the conduct, the washing of my hands. Notice the Bible says, who shall ascend into thy holy hill? Who is going to come into the presence of God? He that hath what? Clean hands. Is not sanitization. And it comes through the door. That's just a symbolization of what really takes place. found it interesting that in COVID, you know, we end up clean, sanitized, not a sanitized. And, and, I, and I'm thinking to myself, and I've heard it being said uh, oftentimes that, now the Lord used this to help us to realize that we need to sanitize our spirit, <laughs> our entire being, spiritual being before Almighty God. That's what he always wanted. We have to be wearing masks, sanitizing our hands. You walk. I've been to buildings where you walk from the gate. When you reach the gate, they sanitize you. And when you get to the building, between the gate and the building to go through the door, they sanitize you again. And I'm saying, I just, was sanitized at the gate. Why do I need to be sanitized again? 
Yes. So as a believer priest, which is who we are today, we have to be cleansed because guess what? Any day, any hour, any time, every minute, the Lord wants a vessel to use. We are available. We are ready. As the Lord doesn't want dirty vessels to use. He wants vessels of honor, vessels that are ready for service. So he said, hey, Peter, ascending some men from Cornelius' house to you. Get ready to go because he needs to be saved. I'm doing some good things, but he's still a good sinner. But I need for him to be transformed, changed forever. Give alms to the poor and him pray daily to the point where angel visit the man. A sinner pray until angel visit him. Can you imagine that? A sinner. A sinner prayed until an angel came and responded to him. And the Lord needed a servant who was cleansed and available so he can use him to get the work done. So I say, hey, Peter, notice where, where did he catch Peter? He caught Peter in prayer. Peter was praying, and the Lord said, hey, Peter, let me give you a vision. Gave him the vision, gave him the instruction, and sent him, and he went under the obedience of the Holy Ghost to carry out the purpose of God. And guess what? Cornelius and his household got saved because there was a vessel that was prepared and ready to do the master's will. Clean hands, pure heart. The cleansing of the feet speaks to the walk of my life. So it's not how we walk now physically. <laughs> All right, so is my feet quick to? run to mischief am i running with gossip rather than the gospel am i feet taking me places where i shouldn't be so my heart is gone and my feet just carry me there so the lord wants us to have feet that are also clean again the conduct of our lives so who shall ascend into thy holy hill? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart is what God is looking for. Because we're looking at being consecrated for service. And we're saying, Lord, I am available to you. So I can say that I'm available because I am consecrated. Because when I'm not consecrated, I'm not available because he's looking for a vessel that is consecrated. Notice when Isaiah was called, what happened? The angel took a live coal off the altar and placed it on his tongue. Why? Because God wants to use Isaiah's mouth to speak God's words. And God said, I can't use your tongue. To speak my words, if your tongue is used loosely, remember James picked up and says, hey, our tongue is a member of our body that is set on the fires of hell, full of deadly poison. In one instance, we bless somebody, the next minute we cuss them out. And the Bible asks, can a fountain bring forth bitter and sweet water at the same time it can't so what kind of fountain what's the condition of my heart because the condition of my heart will be known by the words of my mouth because out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speak it so the lord consecrated before he sent isaiah because he's going to speak on behalf of god so his heart has got to be consecrated. So he doesn't speak loosely anymore. And let me say this clearly for you to understand. If our mouth is used to tell lies and tear down and plant seeds of discords, the enemy has no regard, no respect for 
for us and neither will he come under subjection when we command him or cast him out. A joke may I make, man. A liar tell. A demon will only have regard and respect for somebody whose mouth is consecrated. Every time. Every time. Every time. Very important. So the Lord would have consecrated Isaiah's mouth so that he could use him to speak the words of God. Because the words of God, they are holy. They are pure. So you can't have an unpure, unholy mouth speaking the words of God. God takes no pleasure in such. So not only being cleansed, they now need to be clothed. So after then, you bathe them, it's time to put on some clothes. All right? So let's look at what happened in the Old Testament, and then we take it to the New Testament. As each sect each set that we look at or each example from the old related to the new so we know how and what to do so that we can live consecrated lives before almighty god so after being washed by moses they were now clothed by him so he put on the clothes take note all right so the bible says in exodus 20 29 5 through 9 and thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron and coats and robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and gird him with the curious girdle of the ephod. And thou shalt put the mitre upon his head and put the holy crown upon the mitre. Then, then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. And thou shalt bring his sons and put coats upon them. And thou shalt gird them with girdles, Aaron and his sons, and put the bonnets of them on them. And the priest's office shall be theirs for a perpetual statue. And thou shalt consecrate Aaron and his sons. So you see Moses, after bathing, now he clothed them. All right? Talk about ephod. Talk about mitre upon his head. There's a crown that's placed upon his head. By the way, that mitre upon his head has a gold plate attached to the front that says holiness unto the Lord. And if my memory serves me right, don't quote me. That gold plate that is tied at the forefront of his head weighs about five pounds. Holiness unto the Lord. Put on ephod, the breastplate. And on the breastplate, you have 12 stones that represent the 12 tribe of Israel. So he's carrying on his heart the nation of Israel before Almighty God as he goes into prayer. The ephod is a garment of prayer. If you remember when David came, from, came back to Ziglag and found his home burnt and his wives and children taken captive, he said to Abiathar, the priest, get me the ephod. And when the ephod came, then he said, hey, Lord, what shall I do? He prayed and the Lord provided an answer and said, pursue, overtake, and recover all. Looking at the garments that the priest was actually clothed with, clothed with. After being bathed, he has to be clothed. For what reason? Consecration for service. He's being consecrated. So he has to be washed and he has to be clothed. Follow us, follow me closely. Follow me closely. All right. And after being washed by Moses, Aaron's sons were clothed in separate service. So not only Aaron as the high priest, but his sons as well had to be cleansed. And so the Bible says in Exodus 28, 39 through 42, And thou shalt embroider the coat of fine linen, and thou shalt make the mitre of fine linen, and thou shalt make the girdle of needlework, 
and for Aaron's son thou shalt make coats, and thou shalt make them for, make for them girdles, and bonnets shalt thou make for them for glory and for beauty. The reason they wear these garments is to reflect my glory and my beauty. Amen? And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and the sons with them, and shall anoint them and consecrate them and sanctify them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness from the loins even unto the thigh they shall reach. We don't want any breaches take place. So they've got to be properly covered so that they are not exposed. No flesh should be exposed. Even in the priest going up the ramp to get to the brazen altar outside, it is designed to be a ramp that is without a, without, it's not a staircase, not a step. So the Bible gave instruction for them to make a ramp to walk up to the altar to lay the sacrifice. And the Lord says, why, why that is so, you know, because of that, the Bible says, if the priest is to lift his leg to step up on the step, he's going to expose his flesh. And if he exposes his flesh, I'm going to kill him. Because no flesh can glory in the presence of Almighty God. So you don't have any step to step up on when going to offer the sacrifice. You have a ramp that you walk on so you keep covered, keep consecrated before Almighty God. White linen, which speaks to righteousness, is what they are covered with which is what Jesus, our high priest, imputed unto us or imparted unto us when we became saved. He gave us his righteousness. And that happens through the blood of Jesus Christ. We were justified. And through justification, we got his righteousness because our righteousness, filthy rags. So he gave us his righteousness so we can come before a holy God. Because without righteousness, there's no relationship. God will not have a relationship with an unrighteous man. So God had to know, justify us so that he can relate to us. Abraham was called a friend of God because he was a righteous man. He was justified by faith. The Lord asked him to take his only son and offer him as a sacrifice. And he believed God. And because of his faith in God, he was justified. And he was declared righteous by Almighty God. And that's what happens to us when we repent of our sins and baptized of the Holy Ghost. Baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit. He declares us righteous. He justifies us and gives us his righteousness. So the priest's sons are now clothed for service. So white represents righteousness. And the different colors that the priest actually wear speaks to different um, speaks to different, the different works or different parts of what the Lord has done for us. Like he would be wearing scarlet which represents the blood that was shed for the atonement of our sins. Um, the blue, which represents where he's from. He's from heaven. He's the heavenly one. And the purple that he wore, which is embroidery in his clothing, speaks to royalty because he is the king. All these different pieces of the garment speaks to different things about our Savior and what he has given unto us because today we are royalty. Today we are not only the sons of men which are from the earth, but we are sons of God. Sons and daughters, yes. When I say sons, it means son and daughter. Thank you, Sister Mullins. <laughs> sons and daughters, that's right. All right. So clothed for certain. So the believer today has been clothed and equipped by the Holy Ghost 
to stand against the onslaught of Satan. Watch this carefully, brethren. I want you to catch this very, very carefully. Now, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, 13 through 17, it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Why? That he may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand. In fact, by the time you read from verse 10, it is two times that the Apostle Paul instructs the believer to put on the whole, not a part of the armor. The only way we can withstand the enemy is to put on the whole armor of God. That means I've got to put on the helmet of salvation, which relates to the mitre of the priest in the Old Testament. We've got to put on the breastplate, which relates to the breastplate in the Old Testament. Put on the girdle of truth. Put on the gospel shoes. Let's, let's read it. Let's read it. Let's read it. It says, Having done all to stand, stand therefore having your loins gird about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So number one, I need to have truth, right? The belt of truth. And notice that it's girded around the loins, which is the weakest part of the body. Right? Our belt hold us. Notice when somebody loses a loved one, them hold them belly and ball. Whoa! Yes, but when truth holds you, you are secure. And that's why when we know the truth, no matter what the enemy says, it can't block us, can't stop us. So the thing might be very painful. What Joseph went through was very, very disheartening and painful. Sold by his brother, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, thrown into prison. But he has the truth. And if I have the truth, I can withstand any lie. That's the reality. I need to make sure I know the truth of God's word. And that is a piece of the defense mechanism that I have. So it's not a literal belt. It's the truth. But truth is like a belt that girds my lowest, weakest part of my body and holds me in place. That's what truth does for me. And then righteousness, the breastplate, Covers the internal organs, heart, lungs, kidneys, all these ears that have very soft tissue. If they get punctured, we have internal bleeding and die. So what are the internal organs of our spiritual life? Our worship life, our prayer life. If our prayer life gets attacked, it's because the breastplate is not there. Because righteousness protects prayer. Because prayer produces righteousness. Right actions that are inspired by the Holy Ghost. Because when I'm in prayer, in relationship with Almighty God, He tells me what to do. He instructs me how I should conduct myself. So when I want to give somebody a piece of my mind, the Holy Ghost says, Hey, hold on the man. Tell the man you're sorry. What are him first? I said, tell him that you're sorry. You tell him that you're sorry. Two days after that, he didn't come to church. I said, God, thank you for the him sorry. <laughs> Hallelujah. So now we can preach to him. And when you're preaching to him, you don't throw your words at him now. You, know? <laughs> you gently entreat him because he also needs to be saved. Breastplate of righteousness. All right? And then he says, oh, our feet must be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So I have on my gospel shoes. I want to stop one thing. And helmet of salvation, that I'm saved. It covers my mind. It keeps my mind in place. I have the sword of the spirit. And I have the shield of faith. I have to take on the whole armor in order to withstand the adversary. If I only have a part of the armor, I am exposed if I have a shield and breastplate and no sword. If I don't have any helmet. Brethren, if you go war and have no helmet. <laughs> Where do you think the enemy guy in fire? Straight ahead. If you don't have any shoes, I'm going to attack your feet. Because he hit your feet, you can't come after him. So the whole has to be armored. 
Now let me ask you a question. If I have on the gospel shoes of peace, what is that really saying to me? Let me tell you what that is saying. It means that I'm carrying the gospel everywhere that I go. If I'm not carrying the gospel, I don't have on shoes. If I am not carrying the gospel, do I, am I wearing a shoe? If I'm wearing a shoe, you mean I'm sitting down at home armored for what? I'm armored to go because there's war going on. So the moment I have on shoes, gospel shoes of peace, I'm carrying the gospel to bring mankind who's at war with God into the peace of God. Because mankind is enmity against God. The carnal mind is enmity. And it's only when they bring the gospel that it brings lost humanity into peace with God. So if I'm not carrying and sharing the good news, I don't have any shoes. I don't have any shoes, which battle am I fighting? Which battle am I fighting? Which warfare am I in? Do I have on the whole armor of God? Does that make sense, brethren? Talk to me. I want us to, I want us to see the armor. It's not, it's, not, it's not a gymnastic thing. You know, just come and say, all right, brethren, you can put on a helmet. Everybody put on your helmet. Bam. Everybody put on your shoes. Boom. Put on your belt. Press plate. Get your shield. Get your sword. Ready for war. Let's go. No, no, go, sir. <laughs> Am I saved? Is my head covered? Do I have a prayer life and a consecrated life? Is the breastplate in place? Am I in God's word so I can actually wield the sword? Am I carrying the good news of salvation so I can say I'm actually wearing the gospel shoes of peace? Am I in God's word to be able to not only hold the sword but also to have the shield of faith? Because we get faith from God's word. Hearing of the word produces faith in our lives. Do I have the truth? And am I living it? So I know whether or not I'm armored or not. I know when I'm, whether or not I'm armored. I know. And the only way I can withstand the devil, I've got to be fully armored. There's no other way to beat the adversary, brethren. It's impossible. So don't even mention the sinner. The sinner say, the devil can't do that. That's a lie. They will have people soft, do anything with them. Man and woman live together for 25 years, shock up. Nothing now uh, go on, but everything seems to be good. They will not attack them. And the day they get married, and they reach a reception, and reach a reception, mash up. What has, what's happening? You're suddenly moving from the realm of darkness because the devil don't mind shock up, you know. Because a fiend thing that you don't need to attack it. Why am I attack shock up? Devil don't need to attack no shock up. Make your shock up and live and fool yourself and die and go to hell. But decide to get married, identify with God institution, look like God, we're going to attack that. We're going to mash up that because that look like God. And there was silence in the heavens. Hallelujah. Clothes for service. So we talk about cleansed, talk about clothed, talk about consecrated for service. So initiated by Moses, the anointing oil was poured over Aaron's head, sprinkled his sons, and the oil was a crown on the head of the high priest, running down his beard to the hem of his garment. He was anointed. The composition of the anointing oil was as follows, according to Exodus 30, 22 through to 25. Moreover, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half so much, even 250 shekels, and of sweet calamus, 250 shekels, and of cassia, 500 shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of oil, olive, and hin. And thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. 
it shall be an holy anointing oil. So they got these spices and combined them, crushed them, and made them after the art of the apothecary, like, like the process that is used to make perfume. And they make, put the concoctions together, put the ingredients together, and come up with a concoction. And that is the anointing oil. It must not be used by anybody else. Only those who are positioned for service, which really speaks to the Holy Ghost. Anointed by the Holy Ghost for a reason. Aaron is anointed to do, to carry out the instruction, the work that the Lord has called him to. He's going to stand in the gap on behalf of the nation. He is the mediator between God and man. He's carrying before God the people, keeping them holy and sanctified, consecrated for service. Notice it runs from his head, down his beard, down the very skirt of his garment. It's not a little rubbing on the forehead and anoint you. And just put a little oil. No. It's a five gallon keg bucket. And you pour it and just soak him. You can smell him sweet. As the anointing is sweet. He carries the aura and the fragrance of Almighty God. I'll give you an example. In the Middle East, in these countries where they, they um, spend time in in, in, in investing in perfumes and things like these. Take us back to Persia, I think it was, with Esther. The Esther had to be prepared for one year, one year, right? Before she actually came in before the king. So they would get these herbs and they would have like a lattice. She'd have to have to have to unclothe herself and lay on it. And then underneath you have these leaves. And then you have little flames of fire that quail the leaves. And while she perspires and her pores open up, it begins to absorb that which is coming from the leaves. And she's been purified and she's been perfumed and she's been scented. When you touch her and hold her, you can smell her. She leaves the fragrance on your hand. Have you ever gone somewhere and somebody embraced you and said, how you do? And when they're gone, you smell them on you? All right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some people looking around. <laughs> well, the anointing is actually like that. You carry the fragrance of the Holy Ghost. You walk past and the attention is drawn because you smell the smell. It happens, right? You're at your workplace and the person came into the office and walked past your desk. And you weren't, you weren't paying attention because you're deep down in the work. But the fragrance hit you and you have to stop. And, mm, mm, and start to draw you. What is the name of that woman? Start to pull you. What is happening? Esther carried the fragrance of the king. It's not hers. It belongs to the king. She carries the fragrance and the anointing of the king. And that's what the Holy Ghost does. It fragrances our lives. And we carry the aroma of Almighty God. And that's why when we enter an environment, something is supposed to happen. If natural perfume does that, can you imagine? The fragrance of the Holy Spirit. It's powerful. It disturbs the atmosphere. Somebody walk into an environment and they say, my God, that person is a Christian. You can see the aura, the glow on their lives. And now you just use that opportunity same time and say, yes, have you been born again? Don't walk away and come to church and say, brethren, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, brethren. You know, I went somewhere and they said, I see the glow on me. Oh, praise the Lord. Pray for me in Jesus' name. What is that? 
You just got an opportunity to witness to somebody and throw it down the drain. When Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, hey, you must be a man of God, you know, because no man can do this miracle except God be with him. And then Jesus answered and said, and I'm saying, which question Nicodemus asked? Jesus, Nicodemus made a statement and said, my God, Jesus said, you must be born again. As in his heart, there was a question. And Jesus went straight to his heart and answered the question that he didn't ask. You must Tell me that me is a man of God. Jesus said, that, that's not important. What is important is that you must be born. Must I go back into my mother's belly and be born? No, no, no. That, that, that's natural birth, man. The thing I'm talking you must be born of water and of the spirit. He explained it to him. Guess what? Nicodemus got saved. You read the life. Read, read the Bible. Nicodemus got saved. Seize the opportunity. Like the anointing that's on our lives. And so if we, cons if, we are, if we are cleansed and clothed, then obviously we're going to be consecrated. Because he's not going to separate us. We don't look like the world anymore. We don't dress like the world anymore. Too many persons are seeking to look the same way. It happens on campus. It happens on our campuses with our young people. They don't want to stand out. They want to blend in. They want to be common. They must look like everybody else. So they dress that way. There was a time, you know, in Pentecost, you could actually go to school and leave from school and come to church. A lot of young persons can't go to school and come to church because what they wear to school cannot be worn to church. Because they need to blend in and look like. I'm an, I'm an, well, I've been to campus for a little while now, but I'm accustomed to the youth on campus. And I'm telling you, you would never believe some, some, some of them leave your home and carry clothes in them bag. <laughs> Take out and change clothes. Hallelujah. But we should be able to be different. Because guess what? Look at it. There are other, other persons on campus who have certain identity with certain religion. And they stick out. And they don't mind sticking out. And they can leave from campus and go to their Mask because they were always ready. But they might tell you about your long skirt and tell you, say, you cover up yourself too much. And you don't want that. We want to look like everybody else. You see, that you we are peculiar, different. God clothed the priest. When you saw him, you knew. This is him. He doesn't look like nobody else. He sticks out. He stands out. Because he's not represented. He's clothed for his glory and for his beauty. We talk about worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The very garment that the priest wears is a reflection of the God he worships. So the anointing oil, or this anointing was typical of the anointing of Jesus for service. The Bible says it in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to do what? To preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that... That's why he is anointed. In Acts chapter 10, 38... Paul, sorry, Peter at Cornelius' house says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. So we are anointed for a purpose to do. The power of the Holy Ghost in our lives is the enabling power to do. The power of the Holy Ghost in our lives is the enabling power to do. It's not only to speak in tongues. It is to do the work. Because there's work to be done. And it's the Holy Ghost that's going to enable us and empower us to get the work done. Because we can't do the work of God without the Holy Ghost. 
Because what God gives us to do, we, it's impossible to do it by ourselves. Go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses could not go without the anointing. God had to anoint him and send him. And when he goes, hey, Pharaoh, let my people go. I have to be anointed to do that. Because Pharaoh will kill you. Pharaoh is considered to be a god. You can't just come before him like that. So God had to prepare Moses to face Pharaoh. And it was the anointing on his life that made the difference. And so we are anointed to go. We are anointed for a purpose. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the Christian. Right? Oil, as described in the Old Testament, symbolizes the Spirit of God in our lives today. It empowers us. What else? We are regenerated by the power of the Holy Ghost. We said that earlier. We are baptized into the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters, it is the Holy Ghost that gets us into the body of Jesus Christ. The body of Jesus Christ, the church, is a spiritual body. And to be in the body, to be in the church, we're not talking in the building, to be in the church of the living God, I've got to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So the Bible says we are baptized into the body of Christ by the Spirit of Almighty God. So the baptism of the Holy Ghost gets me into the body of Jesus Christ. And that's why when we take the Lord's Supper, and it's in the body, I need to be in the body to get the benefits. Make sense? If I'm not in the body, taking the supper does not benefit me any at all. Because I'm not in the body. If I'm baptized in water, but not baptized in the spirit, it doesn't help me. Because when the body, remember no, no. These are the benefits of the, of, the, of the supper. It says, those who eat unworthily are going to actually be weak. They're going to be sick. There are some that are weak, some that are sick, and some that will die. Spiritually dead. All right? So, if I take it worthily then, because God has made me and enabled me to be worthy, and I'm in the body of Christ, and I take it, and I'm going to get strength. I'm going to have health, spiritual health, which reflects, and I'm going to have life and not death. So I draw and gain spiritually because I'm in the body. And so when I take partake of God's body and his blood, the benefit that comes from it is what I receive. I'm indwelt. That means my body is the temple. My body is the house where God lives. Sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Ghost also seals us. Put his stamp of approval. When you seal a document, it's, it's authentic. This is genuine documentation. You can carry this document to the bank and to open the door. When we have the Holy Ghost, it's, a, it's God's stamp of approval. That yes, this one belongs to me. If we are not led by the Spirit, then our ministry will be insipid and of no effect. So we need the Holy Spirit to be effective in the work of the Lord. The anointing oil had a sweet fragrance that permeated one over whom it was poured, presenting a beautiful picture of Christ in his perfection and his grace. His life emitted a fragrance, perfection of purity and holiness, and was unmarred by sin or fleshly motives. So the believer emits a sweet fragrance to both God and the world. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 17, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and make it manifest the savor of his, the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved and in them that perish, so that the one, so that, so to the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other we are savor unto life unto life. And who is the sufficient for these things? In other words, the fragrance of my life, which testifies of Christ, for those who accept, it's life. For those who reject, it is death. So the fragrance, depending on how it's received which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the fragrance of Almighty God. If we accept him, 
we receive life. We reject him, we receive death. Same thing happens even in the life of the believer. The Bible says if you go and they don't accept you, shake off even the dust of your feet. Judgment be unto them. There were three prohibitions concerning the use of the anointing oil. Number, the Bible says, Exodus 30, 32, Exodus 30, 32 to 33, Upon man's flesh shall it, be, shall it not be poured, neither shall he make any other like it after the composition of it. It is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. Whosoever compounded any like it, or whosoever put it, any of it upon a stranger, shall even be cut off from his people. The instructions that they got, you can't take this oil that you have made for the priest and his sons and put it on anybody else. If you do that, God said, we're going to take you out. We're going to blow out your lamp. Take you out clean. So only to be poured upon the head, not upon man's flesh. That's why there's a transformation in our mind so we can think right. Not upon the carnality, the carnal man. Was not to be produced for the priest's own use or secular purposes. So what God has anointed us to do, don't use it for selfish gains. So the Lord anointed you to be skillful in playing, and you take it and make money for yourself rather than give it to the glory of Jesus Christ. There are some preachers today, you know. A friend of mine was telling me the other day about this preacher. When he was finished preaching, he asked for a hefty sum, you know. He wanted a certain amount of money. And I said to myself, you know, in earlier times, when you preach, if you can run. And Paul preaching a stone. Stephen preached, and he was stoned to death. Today, we have men, when they don't preach, say, hey, pay up. <laughs> and people take this a business thing, you know. It's a business, make money, exploit the gospel. Like I shared with you, I went to a home to work to assist the lady with her son because she cried out saying that her son was possessed with devils. And when he got there and worked with the son, prayed with the son, delivered the son, she turned around and asked me, how much? I said, how much? Of, how much? What do you mean by how much? I said, how much I owe you? I said, owe me? You don't owe me anything. And she told me about this preacher that's on our, on our, on our radio in Jamaica here. has a national program on the, on the air. When he came there, he charged her $30,000. She paid him $30,000 to cast out the devil to her son. And the devil is still in her son. And she paid $30,000. Freely we have received. Freely it must be given. We can't pay for this thing. God gave us a free gift of the Holy Ghost. Empower us to do his will. This thing is not for sale or for selfish gain. It is for the glory of Almighty God. We are to glorify him in everything that we do, in everything we say, because we are all about him. It was not to be put upon a stranger. Right? So notice who gets the Holy Ghost, those who desire. They're no longer strangers. They come into relationship with the Lord. God draws us, and we accept him, and we embrace, and we surrender, and then he fills us with the Holy Ghost. The sacrifice of consecration, wrapping up. That's the last one. So we are consecrated. So we are cleansed for service. What else? Clothed for service. Then consecrated for service. Then Consecrated. All right, so let's look at the sacrifice and we'll close. The sacrifice, of the, the sacrifice of consecration followed the anointing service with Moses officiating as the priest. All right, so after you've been cleansed and clothed and consecrated, now it's time to be consecrated by sacrifice. So there's a consecration by ser for service and there's a consecration by sacrifice. After I've been anointed, I got the Holy Ghost, I'm going to have to make some sacrifice. I'm going to have to live a sacrificial life unto the Lord. 
I beseech you, brethren, therefore, by the mercy of God, I present our bodies living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable, reasonable, reasonable service. All right, so the sin offering of consecration. So that's one of the offerings that is offered. So the priests have to offer an offering for sin. The Bible says in Exodus 29, 10, and thou shalt cause, and thou shalt cause a bullock to be brought before the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron and his son shall put their hands upon the head of the bullock, and thou shalt kill the bullock before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And thou shalt take of the blood of the bullock and put it upon put it upon the horns of the altar with thy finger and put all the blood beside the basin of the altar and shall and thou shalt take all the fat that is covered the inwards and the caul and is above the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them and burn them upon the altar but the flesh of the bullock and his skins and his dung shall thou burn with fire without the camp it is a sin offering so there are parts of the animal that the lord actually accepts and there are parts that he rejects what is the dung goes outside it's not done on the inside so you separate those dirty parts and take them out and you offer this for sin all right so though we got baptized and though we got filled with the holy ghost we still got to deal with this sin issue so there's a consecration from sin. So we offer our lives before the Lord as a sacrifice and we turn away from sin on a daily basis. Consecrated by. And then there's a burnt offering. So you have a sin offering and a burnt offering. There are two compulsory offerings that must be offered. It is the sin offering and the trespass offering. Those are compulsory. That means it's a must. When I come before the Lord, Two sacrifices must be offered. Otherwise, don't go any further. One is for sin and one is for trespass. One is sin against God. One is sin against man. God said, deal with this first before you approach me. You can't offer me a peace offering and have peace with me and you don't offer the compulsory offering. You can't offer me a burnt offering, which is surrender all of you to me without offering a sin offering and a trespass offering. And you can't offer a meal offering, so you and I can't come and commune together unless the sin and the trespass is dealt with. So the burnt offering of consecration, thou shalt also take one ram, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands upon the head of the ram, and thou shalt slay the ram, and thou shalt take his blood and sprinkle it round about upon the altar, and thou shalt cut the ram in pieces and wash the inwards of him, and his legs, and put them upon his pieces, and upon his head, and thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Burn the whole thing and give it to me. Give me all of you, not a part of you, your mind, your body, your spirit. God says, I want everything. I don't want a part of you. I want all of you. That's consecration. When I give him everything, I give him my time, I give him my treasure, and I give him my talent. So the burnt offering was a sweet savor to God in two ways. Number one, it's a complete devotion to the will of God. I've surrendered to him. It's a sacrifice, number two, was completed accept. It's a sacrifice was completely acceptable as an atonement for sin. All right? This sacrifice was to be offered by the voluntary will of the individual. Today, believers are to voluntarily offer themselves as a living sacrifice to God, which becomes a sweet-smelling savor, consecrated by sacrifice. Ram of consecration, Exodus 29, 19 through 21. And thou shalt take the other ram, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands upon the head of the ram. Thou shalt kill the ram and take of his blood. Did I just read it? Oh, it goes further down. Oh, this is from 19 to 21. The other part is from 15 to 18. It goes down. Right. Then shalt thou kill the ram and take his blood and put it upon the tip of the right ear. Yes. Put on the right ear of Aaron and upon the tip of his right, the ear of his sons, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. 
put it on his big toe, and sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And thou shalt take of the blood that is upon the altar, and of the anointing oil, and sprinkle it upon Aaron, and upon the garments, and upon his sons, and upon the garments of his sons with him. And he shall be hollowed, and his garments, and his sons, and his sons' garments with him. So the blood applied to the right ear symbolizes that the priest's ears are consecrated to God's service. That means he's attentive to the voice of God. Put some blood on his ears, precious blood. Sanctify so that he's attuned to my voice, thus knowing how to function and to speak to the people. He's going to be used of God. He needs to be hearing God. Because how do you do the work of the Lord without knowing what the instructions are concerning the battle that we're waging against? If we're going to battle, we need to know what to do. And the captain of the army will give us instructions. Not every demon is cast out the same way. Not every work. Not everybody receives the Holy Ghost the same way. What is the Holy Ghost saying? Am I hearing what the Holy Ghost is saying? Sometimes they rest your hand on the person's head. Sometimes they don't touch a person at all. Anointing the right thumb with blood signified the power and skill of each individual sanctified hands to the work of the Lord. That means my conduct, my way of life is dedicated to serving the Lord. Anointing the large toe or the priest's right foot with blood symbolizes a sanctified walk. Believers do not walk as the world walk. Walk worthy in all humility, gentleness, patience, and forbearance. That's what Paul described in us walking worthy of the vocation wherein we have been called. Walk as witnesses, imitating God in two ways. Walk in love and walk in light. Walk in wisdom. All of this we actually go through now. When we, have the, when we get the Holy Ghost, this is part of what happens to our lives. This is what actually happens to our lives so that we can be effective in the work of the Lord. And so the blood that remains was mixed with the anointing oil and sprinkled on Aaron and his sons. So you sprinkle, mix the, the blood and the anointing oil and sprinkle them and their garments. The mixture symbolized the combined work of the blood which justifies and the oil which sanctifies. We are justified and we are also sanctified as part of the consecration. Going to stop. Wave offering of consecration. Thou shalt take the ram of the fat of the rump and the fat that covereth the inwards and the call above the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that there is upon them and the right shoulder, for it is a ram of consecration and one loaf of bread and one cake of oiled bread and the one wafer of the basket of the unleavened bread that is before the Lord. And thou shalt put all in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his sons and thou shalt wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. After Moses received the offering from Aaron and his sons to be burnt on this brazen altar as a sweet-smelling savor, he then took the breast of the ram, which was Aaron's consecration, and waved it before the Lord as a wave offering as the breasts became Moses. After Aaron and his sons took the remaining flesh of the lamb, boiled it at the tabernacle door, ate it along with the unleavened bread that remained. So Aaron and his sons repeated the ceremony of consecration for seven days. It symbolizes the complete consecration of the priests who were to represent their, represent their fellow men. Seven days which speaks to complete consecration. So I am consecrated completely. I am consecrated everything to the Lord. It's not a part of me. It is all of me. God wants us as believers to give ourselves to complete consecration to his service. The difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament sacrifice is that it is living the New Testament sacrifice is a living sacrifice as against the one that in the Old Testament is dead. All right? So it speaks to us of being ready to be used in God's will for his glory. 
And this sacrifice is holy because it's set apart for God's service. It is acceptable and it is reasonable. And so we present our bodies as living sacrifice by yielding our members to righteousness and to holiness each day as we live. God bless you in Jesus' name. Let's bless the offering. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. It is to you that we come, it is to you that we give praise and thanksgiving, because indeed you have been faithful, merciful, and kind. We take it not for granted, your loving mercies extended to us another day. Nothing good we did to deserve same, but you looked beyond our faults, you saw our needs and supplied them according to your riches and glory. We look to you even now. Lord, we want to surrender, give all to you so we can be used by you for your glory. If ever a time, Lord, mankind needs to see the glory of you, it is this hour when darkness is getting darker and the deeds of men have become so vile and wicked. Lord God, help us to consecrate ourselves so that we can be tools in your hand to push back the darkness, to obliterate the darkness, to cancel the assignment of hell, and to pull our brothers and our sisters out of hell into this marvelous light. Pull them out of darkness into this marvelous light so they too can experience your mercies, your love, your grace, your compassion that faileth not. And so, Lord, help us to yield ourselves, to be cleansed, to be clothed, to be consecrated for service and by sacrifice so we can be completely consecrated to you for your glory. Do in us that which honors, that which blesses your holy name and brings pleasure to your heart. Lord, this offering about to lift from the hearts of your people, we ask your blessing upon it even now. Sanctify it, Lord, as it goes to the furtherance of your work here on earth. Let somebody, Lord, somebody, Lord, hear and apply these words to their lives so that we can live powerfully for your name's sake and for your glory. Have your way with us. In your precious name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. Any questions before we go while we are lifting the offering? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Yes, Sister Power. All right, any questions? Any questions? Any questions? All right. So we just learned that we must, we must be cleansed for service. And the cleansing has a twofold significance. What are they? Number one. Go ahead, Sister Jo. Hands and feet. All right, which speaks to? Conduct of our lives and the walk of our lives, yes. Sister, Sister Kenesha, so you want to respond as well. <laughs> all right, all right, no problem. Thank you. All right, so that's, so that's cleanse. What about clothes? How, how is it that we're clothed for service? Tell me about the clothing that we wear. What kind of garment do we wear today? Yes, Sister Jervis, huh? The Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost is what brings the anointing. Good try. What else? Somebody tell, help, help. On the whole armor of God, which includes breastplate. The? Our feet shouted the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shield of faith. Sword. Helmet of salvation. A missing you're missing a piece. Belt of truth. That's right. So 
The belt is what goes on first. The breastplate fits into the belt, so it actually holds the breastplate in place. All right, you put on the helmet, put on the boots, get the shield, and get the sword. The whole armor. It's the only way to do what? When you have on the armor, what, what position are you in? You're able to? You're able to withstand the adversary. It's the only way. There's no other way. And you have to be wholly, fully armored. Not partially armored. Partially armored, that means some parts of us are going to be exposed. In fact, the areas that the armor covers is an indication of where the enemy will attack. He'll attack our salvation, attacking our minds. He'll attack our faith, our shield of faith, attacking our commitment to the word of God. He'll attack our prayer life. He'll attack the knowledge that we have of the truth of God as to whether or not it is. I'm questioning. Did God really say? Questioning the truth of God's word. You shall not surely die. Take a taste, man. It'll be okay. You'll be okay. And if I'm not wearing the shoe, my feet are exposed and I can be attacked. So if I'm not carrying the gospel, probably I'm under attack. Not carrying any gospel. Carrying the gospel of gossip and the gospel of tear down and the gospel of discord rather than the gospel of peace. Clothed, consecrated, and that's just a Jervis made mention of by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So that anointing that was poured out on Aaron represents, that oil represents the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so we are anointed for service, to do exploits for God, to do the works that he did and greater works shall he do if he are my disciples. All right? Questions? Questions from the online audience? All right. We're going to pray for the prayer request. Uh, let me stop sharing. Okay. So Shauna, who has a loss of appetite, and Sister Jennifer Young and her family needs covering and deliverance. All right, so I want to pray for Sister Shauna in the name of the Lord and Sister Young. Anybody inside, anybody in house who has a special prayer request as we get ready to go? Yes, Sister Jervis. For your son, what's your son's name? Stephane Bailey for deliverance. Stephane Bailey for deliverance. Roshane Mullins. So Stephane and Roshane. The pet come workers. All right, wonderful. Yes, sister. Pain in your right hand. Okay. Your right hand. Lift your right hand. Lift your right hand. Lift your right hand and say, thank you, Jesus. Your left hand or your right hand? Lift your left hand. Yes, and give Jesus a wave off. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Be healed in the name. Of, somebody say, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, be healed. Be healed in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, be healed. Be healed in the name of Jesus Christ now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. The power. Myron and Jason Campbell, who is in need of deliverance. Yes, Sister Beck, Sister Ford. Fraser's family, yes. Fraser's family also, yes. All right, great. All right, thank you very much for backing me up. Thank you, I appreciate that. Lord, how we thank you again. And what a privilege it is to be able to come before you 
and to make our petitions known. As your people come today, it is to you that we come because you are our help. All of our help comes from you. You, Lord, who made the heavens and the earth. In the name of Jesus, we honor your name, Lord. We honor your name even now. This, these requests before you, Lord, for covering and deliverance, Sister Jennifer Leung and family, Stephane Bailey, Roshane, Byron and Jason, and the Fraser's family. Lord, we hold each of these names before you, and we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray for deliverance. We pray for your delivering arm to reach down, Lord, and bring each mighty God. We ask you to do what only you can do. You are the only deliverer. You are the only Savior. Hallelujah. And so we pray in the name of Jesus Christ for our brothers and our sisters who are in need of so great salvation. We pray, dear God, that every obstacle that stands in the path of deliverance be thou removed in Jesus Christ's name. In Jesus Christ. Christ's name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We cancel the assignment of hell against their soul salvation. This is, the why, this is why you came, Lord, to set the captive free. And so we pray, Jesus, hallelujah, that the captives, these whose names we are calling in your presence, that they will come to experience your grace, your mercies, your love, and come to know you as Lord and Savior. The petcom workers also, we pray for salvation in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Have your way, God. Have your way, Lord Jesus. We pray for the restoration of appetite for Shauna. And we agree again for Sister Johnson's left hand, for that pain to be removed from the root, you know, the cause of that pain. In the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, in Jesus Christ's name, hallelujah. Let us stand, hallelujah. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, thank you. Bless the hearts of your people tonight. And let your kingdom come. Cover us under your blood as we go one from the other. Be thou lifted I, be thou glorified. In your holy matchless name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Tomorrow, Wednesday the 4th, our focus for our consecration would give me bowels of compassion. Give me bowels of compassion. Give me bowels of compassion. Please remember the per hour, 6 in the morning, 12 noon, and 6 in the evening. Tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., there will be fasting and prayer service in the sanctuary. But we continue tomorrow evening at 7.30 online in our Zoom room, the same one that you're on right now. Please join us tomorrow night. And God's willing, spare in our lives. And on Sunday morning, we're back on Zoom for our Sunday school classes. And please make note that our main services are uploaded to our YouTube page. That is Bethel United Church Apostolic Port Moore. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Let's raise our hands for the benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Let all of God's people say amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. Get home safely.